Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, really thrilled to be here with Shira and Cecilia, whose work I've been reading uh, on Facebook uh, and beyond for a long time. In fact, Shira, I first remember reading your work uh, when you were Middle East correspondent for the, for the Times of London, which is whose offices I, I'm currently sitting in. Um, so yeah, versatility is clearly part of your journalistic armory. And you've worked for BuzzFeed, for NPR, as a foreign correspondent and, and a now cybersecurity reporter for the New York Times. So <laughs> interesting career, fascinating career, frankly. Um, and Cecilia, your national technology correspondent for the New York Times. Uh, I remember first reading you at the Washington Post. Um, so you're, you're kind of a master of, of Washington and where, where policy and politics meet uh, with technology. And, and that is obviously a pretty hot space and has been for quite a while now. Um, and, you know, you both have written separately together for the New York Times about technology and in particular Facebook, uh, this kind of behemoth that affects all of our lives in one way or another, even if you're not on it, even if you're not on Instagram, even if you're not on WhatsApp, um, it affects your life uh, almost every day, I think it's fair to say. And so you've written this book, um, An Ugly Truth Inside Facebook's Battle for Domination. Um, I've read it. It's great. And it's probably... I think my colleague Hugo Rifkin in the Times yesterday called it probably the best kind of history of Facebook we've had so far. Um, it's obviously, it, it's still quite a new company. It still changes almost week to week, but um, it's pretty comprehensive, certainly in, in recent years. Uh, but also it takes us back to some of those uh, founding relationships and, and why, uh, how important they are and how they sit at the center of Facebook, particularly Mark Zuckerberg and Joel Sandberg. It's fascinating dynamics between them. So we'll get into all of that. Um, I guess, you know, to start with, um, I'd be really interested to know from you both uh, why you, how and why you chose to write this book, how, how you came to sort of take, because I'm always very jealous. I don't understand how journalists find time to write books because I barely find time to write articles. So <laughs> how did you, how did this project start and, and why really? I think it, it really started out of a natural partnership between Cecilia and myself. We had written so many articles together in which we found ourselves repeating things over and over. Facebook apologizes, Facebook admits mistakes were made, um, Facebook says it's going to change. And you know, there's a pattern there. And as a reporter, you always have so much left over in your notebook, so much sort of juicy, colorful, behind the scenes details of how these conversations happened, who was involved, that add nuance and perspective to incredibly consequential moments, uh, both here in the United States and really globally. And so being able to take all that and put it in a book and not just say, well, Facebook made a mistake with Cambridge Analytica or Facebook made a mistake when it came to Russian election interference, but to take you into the rooms where those mistakes happened and where decisions were made about how Facebook was going to handle it, it just, it felt worthy of a book and it felt like a story that we could really, we could really tell well together with, you know, Cecilia and her expertise in Washington and myself out in, uh, in San Francisco. Yeah. You know, I would only add that this actually started with one question that our editor at the New York Times asked us back in 2017, I think, which was, when some of the first scandals were coming to light about foreign election interference and privacy problems, um, she asked, her name is Pui Wing Tan, she asked, what really is going on at Facebook? And that was an important animating question because so much had been written about Facebook and Facebook is so incredibly concerned about controlling its image. It has hundreds of public relations people to make sure to, to protect their image. We thought it was actually just for us, journalistically, we were incredibly curious to try to really dig into that question and to go beyond the talking points, beyond the varnished image that Facebook presents to understand really a few things, how the company works as a technology, how the company works as a business model, who the leaders are and what kind of decisions they're making. And I will not pretend that we came up with this plan from the very beginning. It was quite a journey, Josh, as you said, like you don't know how people write this book. I'm not necessarily one to recommend writing a book. It was hard, but it's been very rewarding at this point. Um, and that's what we tried to cover in the book. It's sort of those three aspects, the leadership, the business and the technology. And that's just, before we get into the meat of it, I think that's really interesting you mentioned Facebook's public relations because you know I wrote a, a profile recently of Nick Clegg, obviously a senior figure at Facebook for our magazine at the, at the Sunday Times. And 
you know, I've dealt with a lot of public relations officials in my life, some better than others, uh, some more active than others. I have never come across anything <sighs> like the Facebook public relations machine. I felt like I knew these people better than I knew my own family by the time I, you know, and this was one piece in a, you know, in a magazine, not even in America about one Facebook figure. How hard has it been for you guys to navigate that? I mean, you know, are they scared of you? Are you scared of them? What is this relationship like? And how much of your time do you spend fending off Facebook's just enormous and enormously skillful public mm -hmm. relations? You know, I was dealing with guys who were, you know, ex, you know, top advisors to top, most yes. democratic politicians, it seemed. Um, you know, how does it work for you? Um, you know, Josh, you mentioned that I, I spent a decade in the Middle East, much of that writing for the Times of, of London. Um, I, uh, I'm very practiced at dealing with dictatorships, um, with authoritarian regimes that don't want stories told. I think that's probably what attracted me to writing about a lot of these really big tech companies that have so controlled their message. I mean, many of us become journalists because we want to get accurate and truthful and objective information out there. We don't want the varnished company, you know, PR line. That's that's not what um, that's not what serves democracy. It's not what serves the public. Um, and I, I, I can't say how uh, if Facebook is scared of us. I, I can say that we are not afraid of Facebook. Um, we found in the journey of reporting this book that employees wanted to talk to us I mean, Facebook has somehow sometimes taken the line that we only spoke to employees that were disgruntled and I would I would say that's absolutely not the case you know of the 400 some people we spoke to for the book the vast majority still work at the company they spoke to us because they they care about Facebook they saw things going off the rails they saw mm. their leadership making mistake after mistake and not accounting for it and their motivation wasn't wasn't making the company better it was enforcing their their executives really to be transparent about what happened there and and perhaps you know start change um, and so, yes, I mean, we're incredibly thankful to the people that spoke to us for this book because it made it possible to not have to deal with, you know, as you know, 10 hour long PR phone calls that go on over the so course long. of a week. So long. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and speak to people who weren't reading off a script. Mm. Mm. Um, so, you know, look, the, the, the narrative of Facebook, to, to put it crudely, has been sort of hero to zero in the sense that, you know, we... You know, I, I first started using Facebook in 2006. I just joined university. It was really fun. And we had a lot of fun with it. Uh, I'm sure we all made stupid mistakes at the time, but <laughs> it was great. And we were all kind of besotted with this new technology. It was connecting mm -hmm. us to each other. I made friends, you know, traveling in Australia and I kept in touch with them. And, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. By 2017, 2018, yeah. um, you know, Facebook's re re reputation really was in the gutter. And, you know, we now have this books by people you'll, you'll know well, people like Shoshana Zuboff, Roger McNamee, um, you know, really, and, and others, really painting Facebook as a possibly the most significant threat to our democracy today, that it's mm -hmm. undermining our elections, that it's undermining the way we act as a society, that it's allowing hate to flourish, that it's allowing Burmese hunters to, you know, uh, to, to, to oppress their populations that it's been the tool of authoritarian governments how bad is facebook i know this is a big question but you know yeah. do you think we've maybe swung too far the other way do you think the pendulum has become uh you know too unfair to facebook or actually are these problems just as profound as, as its critics say they are well look facebook has 3.4 billion users across its three apps around the world it is the historically the largest communications his, uh, communications tool to ever connect that many people on earth. It is big, it's powerful, it deserves attention and it deserves scrutiny, absolutely. It is, um, it is a company as far as how, how bad is it? Well, it's, I think some of the anecdotes can let people judge for themselves. I mean, even today, very recently, the chief of staff of the White House said, that when they're talking to Americans who aren't willing to be vaccinated, he, they ask these Americans, well, why not? And oftentimes the people will say things that are just false, like the vaccine leads to X, Y, and Z, which is completely ludicrous and false. And then the White House asks, well, how, how did you get that information? And almost always, this is Ron Klain, the chief of staff of the White House said, they learned it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So we're still seeing the, the present danger of the flow of misinformation. We're seeing the present danger of 
of a business model that prioritizes engagement and growth and therefore so it doesn't put the safeguards in place and, and a company doesn't have a lot of the speech policies in place to protect its users. So I can't say how dangerous it is. I think a lot of people already have their own opinions and there is a lot of great literature out there already. I think what we do in the book is really lift the hood for people to understand how this actually works and through example of an example of example show in, in real like very colorful detail what the consequences are of this machine. Mm. Mishara? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, mentioned Myanmar, for me, that was like, really, honestly, one of the most powerful chapters in the book to write, because it, it's a story that people think they know. Um, I think people understand that Facebook played a role in spreading hate speech there. But I don't think people understand how many warnings Facebook got. I mean, we document in detail in this book how people were raising flag after flag after flag and saying, this is this is bad. You know, it's not it's not just one post, it's not just a dozen posts. It is radicalizing people um, in, in anti-Muslim hatred across Myanmar. And to see Facebook ignore that, even when someone comes to their company. Oh, we gotta stall out. Oh, share a price. I'm gonna, you know, we have become like a mind mel, sharing myself. So <laughs> I might even be able to complete her thought. Yeah, go on. I bet you moderator can. Oh, here's over 100 languages are spoken. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that you lost me. I don't know when you lost me. <laughs> um, somewhere in a, a sort of yeah, Myanmar. Somewhere uh, in my, I'm lost in Myanmar. Um, the pattern. I was just, in the patterns there and they had you know one burmese speaking moderator in a country where over 100 languages are spoken to me that was such a damning detail mm. um you know how can you possibly hope to understand what's happening in Myanmar? how can you possibly hope to avert the spread of hate speech there when you don't even have people that are speaking the languages to moderate the content that is coming from there so there's, an, there's, a, there's a kind of vignette at the beginning or more than a vignette sort of a, 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 a chapter if you like at the beginning of your book that is very eye-catching to me and it's about Facebook engineers uh, who were fired about seven years ago, 52 of them, um, for abusing the system and in this case it was using it to stalk women or to um, find, you know, find out what women were, who they wanted to date or to, to check up on women who had rejected them, this sort of thing. Um, and the reaction from Facebook, obviously these people do eventually get fired, but it's, it's that classic Facebook thing we've seen that it's, it's kind of slow, it's, it, it, it doesn't quite seem to worry, it doesn't quite seem to give the problem the precedence it, it probably should have done. Well, I wonder why you started the book with that story mm -hmm. and what it sort of illustrated for you about the company that you, that you were writing about. Um. You know, we thought it showed something about what their priorities were. So in order to understand the importance of that anecdote, you have to understand why these engineers were able to stop women, essentially, and, and, and find that kind of data on users. And it's because for Mark Zuckerberg, when he launched the company, when he hired his first employees, the priority was growing as quickly as possible. It was moving fast and scaling things. We have a profanity in the book, which I'm not going to include on, on the show today. But engineers were encouraged to ship products as quickly as they made them. And in order to do that, he gave them free access to user data. It was a way of getting them to work very, very quickly. You don't have to theoretically see if something works. You can test it on a real person in that moment and see, do they like this feature that I've created or not? Even though they were firing people year after year, and those, those 52 people you mentioned, that was just in one, I think, two-year time frame that was studied. We don't know how many people were fired before then, and we don't know how many people were not caught. Mm -hmm. We just know that in one two-year time frame, they caught 52 people. Yeah. They kept that feature going until it was literally flagged for them in a report they could no longer ignore. Their new head of security said, this is a huge issue. Your own employees are over and over again abusing their access to user data because you have not created ways and systems to catch them and stop them. You have, you have made it so that, you know, it's a matter of time before this happens again. And he insisted that it, that it be changed. And it was only then that Mark Zuckerberg sort of said, oh, right, well, let's change this. It highlighted for us a problem and a pattern that was going to repeat over and over again in every chapter, which is not acting proactively, not seeing around the, the next corner. And honestly, not, not seeing the potential for, 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 you know, for things being misused and, and mm. things being misused by bad actors. Mm. And so, 
you know, at the at the very core of Facebook and, and at the core of your book is this relationship between Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg. Um, and they also go on quite an interesting journey. <laughs> There's an interesting narrative to arc to that. It starts, it's, it's this kind of magic meeting at a party. They talk for hours. You get the sense Zuckerberg isn't that interested in most people. Don't really think most people have much to say to him because he's so, so ahead of everyone, but he really wants to listen to Sheryl Sandberg. He senses that she can provide something for Facebook that he doesn't have. He has this vision, he has these skills, but he doesn't necessarily have the, the business now, so the Washington clout to turn it into what it is today. So they have this kind of meeting and for a long time, it seems like a kind of golden partnership. But in your book, you show that it has soured somewhat in recent years, possibly over the Trump era, which you know soured so many relationships and, and broke so many friendships. And um, So t talk me through th th their partnership and where are they today? I mean, it, it, you, one can conclude somewhat from your book that Sheryl Sandberg is not the power she once was at Facebook, but, but tell me more about them. Yeah, you know, as one executive, told us and it's in the book um the company is no longer led by a number one and a number two is now led by a number one and many so that tells you the current state of facebook so what happened when facebook began to as you said went from hero to zero when it really was was you know going to this sort of downward reputational spiral is mark zuckerberg decided to seize much more control over all the things actually that he found boring and that he delegated to Sheryl Sandberg for many, many years. That meant especially policy decisions and what was happening in Washington. And he was really upset and he expressed to people that he was really upset with the way that Cambridge Analytica, the data privacy scandal, as well as election interference had led to this, this reputational crisis for the company. He blamed Sheryl Sandberg. It should be noted that both of those things, they're both sort of breaches that stem from his side of the business. He was a products guy. He was making the decision that allowed data sharing and allowed for, for these things to happen that were that Sheryl Sandberg was supposed to clean up image-wise. So he was disappointed. And we saw in what's known as the wartime meeting around 2018, Mark Zuckerberg declares to his executives, and we have in the book a meeting where he essentially says, like, look, a CEO during peacetime can do what I did before, you know, which is to delegate certain things. But when you're in wartime, you have to really seize control. And Mark Zuckerberg is somebody who really sees himself as, you know, in this case, he kind of compared to himself as like a godfather mafia boss, but he also sees himself as like a great leader, um, like a Caesar Augustus. He really actually really looks to Caesar Augustus as a real role model. And, um, and so it was a real turning for, point for him personally. And we saw Mark Zuckerberg taking really, really much more um, control over big decisions on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, videos about her that were doctored and false about Donald Trump himself. And whenever he would post things that actually violated the company's speech policies for any other person, but not for Trump. Mm -hmm. And we saw actually the consequences of that, of course, but we also saw that Sheryl Sandberg, who was really in a way hired, not just to do the things that Mark Zuckerberg didn't wanna do, but was kind of hired to be the adult in the room, that her role began to diminish. So what we're seeing right now is, a partnership that used to be much more um, uh, like, like sort of a self-serving, like self, uh, self-reinforcing kind of great cycle of both of them bringing something different and what the other one needs to him taking a much bigger role and her role actually being much more questionable. Mm -hmm. So just to remind everyone, uh, if you've got any questions as we go along, stick them in the Q&A box and you know, we'll obviously address them later on in the chat. Um, so, you know, you, you, you say the company went from, uh, you know, one and two to one and many. Uh, one of those many, uh, you know, and I've mentioned already is Nick Clegg, someone I'm interested in. I think a lot of Brits are interested in because we, you know, said goodbye to Nick Clegg um, a few years ago. And we remember him from the coalition government here. Mm -hmm. And he's totally reinvest reinvented himself with, with some success um, as a top level figure at Facebook. How important is Nick Clegg's role at Facebook? How much, how valued is he, and is he partly responsible for the for the for the somewhat marginalisation of, of Sheryl Sandberg? Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, I mean, 
he, um, you know, he's in a way he's become Facebook's chief diplomat. Mm. Facebook is currently facing some very um, challenging battles in Europe and in the rest of the world. And um, Nick Clegg's experience in Europe is, is certainly, I think, going to be a, a great asset to them. And that's that's one of the reasons they brought him on board. He also seems to really earn the trust of some some key executives, including Mark Zuckerberg and, and, and um, Joel Kaplan. You know, I, I wonder if um, if this all was happening 10 years ago, if the role he's playing now wouldn't have been played with, by Sheryl Sandberg. And it we have seen and documented in our book how he's done media appearances and he's gotten out in front of controversial moments at times where, where certainly that would have been Sheryl Sandberg a few years ago. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see how successful he is in Europe and with the challenges that lie ahead there. And is it all talk or can he actually make a difference um, in terms of how Facebook is perceived by many, by many <coughs> sorry, by many European leaders? Mm. And, you know, uh, the, the narrative around Clegg and the narrative around Facebook more generally is we're listening, we're learning, um, we're changing, that we've appointed someone like Nick Clegg, who is a you know, European liberal, because we understand that this sort of Silicon Valley steam train needs reining in. Um, and, you know, Nick Clegg has championed something called the Oversight Board, which is a, an external body that Facebook can refer decisions to primarily about content moderation, most, mm -hmm. most conspicuously whether to allow Donald Trump uh, back onto the platform. Um, do, you, that, do you buy that narrative? Do you think that they are interested in structural change? Or do you think this is what a lot of people in this country feel, Nick Clegg has been brought there to do a PR makeover uh, so that Facebook doesn't have to change, to fend off regulation, to protect its business model? How, how do you view that narrative? So first of all, great profile, Josh, I read it. Yeah. And I, I wrote a profile as well, as well on Nick Clegg with one of my colleagues at the Times. Um, I think a lot of people will say that they do not see evidence yet of structural change. That's at least at least the, 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 the engineering from um, Nick Clegg at all. Nick Clegg was, did one really important thing early on, which was he told Mark Zuckerberg, you need to be out there. You need to be out there in public. You need to be out there in Washington, meeting with Trump and other people. You need to be out there meeting with lawmakers around the world, meeting with Macron and other world leaders, and just being the face and showing that you are in, not just in control, but that Facebook has a plan, mm -hmm. that Facebook wants to be pressed. So what they talk about in these meetings is Facebook says, and this is Nick Clegg encouraging Mark Zuckerberg, we embrace regulation. And we think and we, we realize that we are big and we are powerful and it's just too much responsibility. So please help us, guide us the way. I think a lot of people would say inside, they do say inside and outside the company, that it's a bit of a cop out, first of all, because you could and you had many opportunities to self-regulate and actually really self-regulate. And the other thing is, is that Facebook is such a big and powerful company right now. It can withstand regulation in many ways that other companies cannot. And there are arguments that actually regulation can even help them cement their dominance and their and their market share because small companies can't break in because of their cotton. They have to subscribe to this kind of regulation. So I I think that you know the role of a chief diplomat, if you were to further that that great metaphor or analogy that um Shira brought up, um, it's often meeting, negotiating, you know, presenting new ideas, structural, structurally, we have not seen anything change to some very, very key things, which is number one, the fact that growth continues to be the number one goal and that the business model, which is based on engagement and trying to get people to come back over and over again. And we showed through story after story about how these things were formed, these, these two really main pillars of the company and how that's not changed at all. Mm. Mm. And so, you know, the, the, the allegation ones here, a lot, a lot, one has thrown at Facebook a lot is that they are profiting off hate. That part, the, the, the core to their business model is, is basically allowing for the proliferation of people's absolute worst instincts. Um, and that draws people in and it, you know, allows them to profit off that. Facebook vehemently deny that. You know, <laughs> I, can't, I can hardly count how many different people at Facebook have said to me, that is not our business model. We, that's not how we roll. That's unfair. Um, you know, in England, we've had, uh, you may have followed, uh, we've had a sort of great 
eruption of news this week following our very tragic loss in the Euros final last Sunday, which was that there was a torrent of racial abuse, vile stuff, hurled at three England players, um, black England players who, who missed penalties, a lot of it on Facebook and a lot of it on Instagram. Um, and so this debate has come up again, you know, are they profiting off this stuff? Why are they allowing the stuff to proliferate? Do you think, it, do you think this stuff is core to their business model? Why, why can't Facebook simply prevent people sending monkey emojis to black England players using the N word? Like, why is that, why can't they just stop it? What's, to a lot of lay people, it just seems like, what, make, just make it stop. You know, Mark Zuckerberg is so powerful. This is technology is so advanced. What's going on? I, um, that's such a wonderful question because that example really is, is a perfect one of how the pattern keeps repeating itself over and over again. Um, you know, Facebook is, is very, as you said, very careful to say that they don't promote hate on their platform. And that's a very clever PR skirt of what they do, which is to promote anything emotive on their platform. What rises to the top of Facebook's algorithms are things that inspire emotions, whether that's hate or love or anger or sadness or outrage. That's what people engage with. That's what you often see first when you log into Facebook. It's the things that are, that are gonna drive your engagement. And so that's one of the reasons why we keep seeing these things go, go viral on Facebook and spread on Facebook, whether here in the United States, it's a narrative that the election was stolen, that there was widespread voter fraud, both, both of those things false. Um, whether in England, it, it's hate speech being directed at athletes. These things, you know, people will see them and they get angry at seeing them. They're not supporting the racist epithets that were thrown at those football players. Um, but in their outrage, in lingering on that post for an extra 30 seconds, or maybe even hitting the dislike button, they're still telling Facebook, I'm engaged in this. Mm. I've spent more time on your platform when you showed me this at the top of my newsfeed. And so, you know, the, the talk is often of regulation. We hear it in Brussels, we hear it in London, we certainly hear it in Washington, DC. Um, Facebook seemed pretty good at fending off that regulation. They obviously have an incredibly powerful mm -hmm. and well-funded lobbying operation, people like Joel Kaplan in, in Washington and, and others. Um, are we ever going to see serious regulation of Facebook? What, what might that look like? You know, where do you think this is headed? Yeah, I mean, so the energy level toward regulation is so high. It's just so, there's so much interest in, reg, interest in regulating big tech more than I've ever seen. And I've been covering this for quite some time. Um, how specifically they can rein in the big tech companies is really just, there's so many questions as to how they can actually execute on that. That a federal court recently threw out a lawsuit to break up Facebook. And that shows the limits actually of enforcement action and that the courts in some ways think a little bit differently than these regulators the particularly the biden administration's picks to to regulate big tech the biden administration very much has shown that it has picked people to lead the agencies of that oversee big tech that and these people have been very vocal about their desire mm -hmm. to regulate to better protect consumers on the internet and to break up companies like facebook mm -hmm. but there's you know, there is like some limits in terms of the courts, but at, but at the same time, I'm seeing legislative action like I've never seen before also. A suite of antitrust bills passed through a House committee is gonna at some point go to the House floor and then go to the Senate. I This is new, it's a new energy that I think um, shows that there's a lot of bipartisan interest in regulating the companies. It's, it's the, the question is how do you fit century old, decades old, in some cases centuries old law to, to, you know, to regulate companies that just defy the definitions of the economies and the, the businesses for when those laws were first created. It's like mm. putting square pegs in round holes. It's really yeah. hard right now. And so, you know, I, I think that they're going to be regulated, but it's not going to be even this year. It's going to mm. be some time. Mm. And so talk to me a little bit more about Mark Zuckerberg, the man. I love this uh, Octavian Augustus uh, vision he has. You know, we, we hear a lot about Zuckerberg, the man, and it's often quite quirky stuff. It's the guy who teaches himself to butcher his own meat, who's teaching himself Mandarin. It's, it's, it's this kind of, he's portrayed to us as this slightly, I guess, cyborg-like kind of, uh, you know, slightly otherworldly figure. 
um, phenomenally bright, probably not very patient with people or, you know, I don't, obviously you guys, didn't, he, he didn't deign to be interviewed for your book. Um, I suspect you've, you've probably both met him over the years, but wh what's your sense of Mark Zuckerberg, the man? And what does he want now? I mean, he's, he's got this trillion dollar company, the levers of world power at his fingertips, but what does he, I mean, he's still, you know, barely 40 or whatever he is. What does he, what does he want? Who is he? Right. You know, Mark, who, you know, he's, um, he's 37. He's going to be 38. Right. Um, we were really interested in that as reporters. You want to know what drives this incredibly wealthy and powerful man. And what was interesting was how early on in his life, he knew that he wanted to be powerful and historic. Mm. And that his obsession with, uh, you know, with Augustus Caesar, with that time in history, with, with history in general, and with what creates power, what creates influence. When he launched Facebook, he was very clear, and, and we spoke to people who knew him at that time in Harvard. He was very clear that he wanted data because data was powerful. He wasn't thinking about wealth at that point. He wasn't thinking about, you know, Washington and US politics. To be honest, I still, you know, I don't think that's his natural state. He was thinking about data and how in this new age of the internet, the person who held the most data about people would therefore hold the most power. And to this day, I, th I think power is, is really what drives him and the sense that he has achieved something in, in creating a historic company that in a hundred years, history books will likely mention Facebook as the first truly global social network. I mean, yeah, I was as an undergraduate thinking about how to afford better vodka and finish my essays. So <laughs> that slightly terrifies me. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, there are these, there's a lovely little vignette in your book where Mark Zuckerberg hosts uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page and Eric Schmidt, the sort of three guys, founders and, and CEO of Google, um, mm -hmm. for a meeting. And it's in his tiny little sort of studio in Palo Alto. And he, he, people are sitting on futons, these kind of vast figures uh, in our technological landscape. Um, and, and they're discussing a merger. I mean, was there seriously a possibility that, that Google and Facebook might, that Google might have acquired Facebook? I mean, it's sort of now one, you know, one already thinks of these companies as far too large. I mean, that's a Google Facebook kind of mm. uh, sort of Ouroboros. I mean, it's just a terrifying thought. Like what, what, what was that about? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it was a merger. Um, and we don't know that it was a discussion of a merger, but there were discussions about what kind of partnership can emerge. Right. Um, that said, you know, the Mark Zuckerberg at that time when they met, he was a really, really hot figure. What I mean by that is not like people were really interested in trying to understand him. There is always a hunt for the next big founder. It's mm -hmm. like there's just in Silicon Valley, this look, this the, the founder mythology is so strong. And the idea that there's going to be a boy genius to create the next technology. And Mark appeared to be that person. So at that point, Google was a little bit more mature. Obviously, it started about several years before Facebook. And that we everybody was seeing the social network that was doing something different and that this, there was this guy who was very young, who dropped out of Harvard, he had all the same sort of echoes of the Bill Gates sort of story, drop out of Harvard, who was doing something that looked impactful. So yes, um, they all met in Mark Zuckerberg's apartment. Um, I believe that Eric Schmidt sat on the mattress. There was just a kitchen, kitchen table and two chairs. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, um, as Shira said, he's interested in power. He's not necessarily interested in material things at that point. Clearly now we're seeing with his many estates that he does care about some material things for sure. And um, yes, that was a time when um, he turned down Yahoo for a $1 billion merger. And that was one of the reasons why Sheryl Sandberg wanted to meet him. Who is this guy who was well known to turn down a $1 billion merger offer from Yahoo? Who, who would have that kind of confidence and that sort of audacity to do so? So it was a really interesting time for Mark. And you can imagine that it fed into his confidence and the person that he has become today. Mm. Okay, we're gonna have one more question from me and then we've got some questions coming in at the box. So if you've got any more questions out there, now's your time to input them. Um, you know, July 6th, obviously a big moment for Facebook. The hope was for Facebook that having clearly not come out shining from the 2016 presidential election that they were going to have a better run this time around they did put some new systems in place although 
people like Yael Eisenstadt, who's, who left Facebook, uh, have said that those systems were woefully inadequate or she wasn't allowed to, to really do what she wanted there. She was there to try and sort of improve Facebook's role in the election. Um, but they probably came out of 2020 better than they came out of 2016 until maybe we got to January 6th. January 6th, the invasion of the Capitol, what many people would call an insurrection, frankly, in Washington, D.C., um, much of which was discussed, organized, activated on, surprise, surprise, Facebook. So how damaging was that to their kind of narrative of we're getting better at this, uh, we've got new safeguards? Um, did January 6th just kind of send all that up in a puff of smoke? I mean, what's the aftermath of all of that been for Facebook? You know, I think January 6th was an excellent example of highlighting exactly what Facebook has not yet addressed. Facebook, you know, uh, rightfully says that they have helped stop disinformation on their platform. They've helped create a model for how other companies can stop disinformation by forming the security team that is now very active in rooting out Russian, Iranian, Chinese, etc. Uh, disinformation campaigns. And so what happened in 2016 is, is now much, much harder to, to begin to accomplish. I mean, the Russian, Russian campaigns are now found almost monthly on Facebook and removed. What they haven't figured out is misinformation. It's people spreading bad information to one another, people spreading conspiracies to one another. That's what happened on January 6th. For months, this narrative spread on Facebook that the election had been stolen, that voter fraud had happened. And these groups gained traction and they got people angry. And this, I mean, Donald Trump himself was allowed to share things that were, that were categorically untrue about the vote and about the election. And that as that anger ferments, people unite on Facebook and they ultimately decide to come down to Washington. And, you know, on the eve of January 6th, reporters were sending Facebook examples from groups where people were posting assault rifles and saying, I'm bringing this gun to Washington, who's with me? Facebook removed those groups, but the fact that reporters had to, like myself, had to point them out and say to them, are you going to take this down before they could take them down? I think it just shows how much work the company still has to do. You know, it's, it's still a whack-a-mole approach where they've got this hammer and they're swiping in every direction. That, you know, ultimately, how long can, can that be Facebook's approach? Yeah, I mean, when you're looking at America today, uh, you have a third, a third of the country kind of not taking the COVID vaccines, which are widely available. Um, and then you have, a, you know, a Delta variant spreading rapidly, really in, only in the places where people aren't taking the vaccine. And you can't just blame all of that on Facebook, of course, but it's clearly not helping. Um, last quick thing from me before we go on to the Q&A. Donald, you meant, which I really want to know is whether you think we will ever see Donald Trump back on Facebook. Oh. I thought they really rather fudged this decision. You know, they yeah. were, the oversight board yeah. were going to do it. it and then they kind, of, yeah. they kind of said, actually, you know, kick it. the can kind of got kicked down the road. Ultimately, it seemed to me like Mark Zuckerberg and, and a couple of others were making the decision. But are we ever going to see Trump back on Facebook? What, you know, what, what's the score there? Well, isn't it interesting that the two-year ban ends right now? Trump is banned for two years and that ban will end in right. January, exactly, <laughs> at a time when he can begin to run for the president again for the 2024 election. So, I mean, I don't know, Josh, should we take a bet right now? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I actually think he's going to be, I think he's going to be brought back on. What about you, Shara? You know, I think Facebook's going to watch and see what he does over the next 10, for the next two years. Sorry. Um, maybe it'll depend on how likely he is to become president again. I think he's likely to run for re-election and, and win, Facebook might be wary of um, antagonizing uh, a future president uh, of the United States. Um, I, do, I do think they're watching to see what he does in the interim right now and how he uses his platform on other, he still has a platform on other um, you know, more friends, social media sites. And so I'm sure they're watching that closely and, and a lot can change in the next two years. Yeah, and I just would add, I, I said rather glibly, like I think either he's gonna be put on, and I. The reason why I say that is actually because I just don't think Facebook wants to ban any political figures, really. They err so strongly on free expression. They err so strongly on this belief that political speech deserves a special category mm -hmm. and that bad speech drowns out good speech. And I think that's sort of this premise and belief and underlying bedrock for all of Mark Zuckerberg's decision is that free expression works somehow. And he believes that the site 
though he's tweaked that and he's evolved a little bit, I think he's really loath to ban any political figures. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to turn to some of our questions. Um, this is an interesting one from Sarah, who says, mm -hmm. what is the end goal of Facebook? Does Mark Zuckerberg have political ambitions to change society as well as to make money? What do you mm -hmm. think? I think Mark Zuckerberg wants every human on earth who has an internet connection to be a Facebook user. And I really mean that. I think he really believes that his, his ability to be a historic figure is to connect the whole world. Um, we've heard that mantra so many times, connect the world, connect the world. What he doesn't do is say what happens next when the world is connected. And that's really one of the reasons why we wrote the book is we've seen all the consequences of that. Um, I, I, you know, I think the future of Facebook is uh, the trajectory doesn't look like it's going to change at all, especially with the leadership in structured as the way it is. There's no oversight of Mark Zuckerberg by the board of directors. There is in, internally, he has more power and more decision making um, sort of authority than any than any time, really. Right. Um, so so I don't expect things to really veer into a different course. It may look different, Facebook, the app, it may have different functions, but the core things about the technology and the business, I don't think will change from what we're with, with those sort of things in place still. So this is an interesting question uh, about Sheryl Sandberg. How much is Sheryl Sandberg's lean in culture mantra reflected in the Facebook offices? What's it really like to be a woman at Facebook? You know, and that, that's interesting because obviously we, we still have this kind of sense of Silicon Valley as very male dominated, a kind of bro engineering driven culture. Has that changed at Facebook? Has Sheryl Sandberg changed it? Well, I think when Sheryl Sandberg first joined Facebook, there were some certainly some changes made at the very, very beginning of her uh, start at the company. We've heard from women who say, well, you know, finally there was a woman you could come speak to. Finally, there was a woman at the top that you could at least voice your, your issues with. Um, but it's interesting, some of those same women who were so thankful to have her join said that upon reflection a year or two later, they were they were incredibly disappointed. Um, and how little sort of fundamental change happened at the top. I mean, this is a company where all the executives are still overwhelmingly male. Um, I think it was what point two years ago, they had more executives named Chris than they had women serving as executives. Um, you know, it's, it's part of it is engineering culture. Part of it is that, you know, when they look at who they hire, they, they, they claim that it's higher, harder to hire women than it is to hire men. But, you know, fundamentally, Facebook still has an issue with with women and how women get promoted within the company that that many women spoke to us for um, about for this book. Mm. So this is a kind of anonymous creed occur says most people know that Facebook is bad, but owing to its monopoly and obviously that includes Instagram and WhatsApp, we feel trapped dependent on it for communication. Mm. How can this cycle be broken? Mm. I mean, it, it's so true, right, that many people feel like they have to use these apps. I think anybody who's part of a group, a sports group or a club, a parent association will you know, oftentimes have to subscribe to some sort of Facebook group because that's where people communicate. Um, it has become absolutely utility for, for many people, especially around the world and outside the U.S., um, I don't know if people are trapped. I think some people feel trapped. I think a lot of people feel very ambivalent about their experience. They know that they're uncomfortable with all the news that they've heard over the last several years. And they have a sense of some of the consequences and the collateral damage that comes from the company and its decisions. But they also feel like, well, this is actually the only place where the majority of my friends and family are, where my school actually issues announcements for my children. I mean, it's it's at this point become such a, such a ubiquitous tool that's being used for communications beyond the phone. I mean, it's just, I don't, I think it's influence as it's just, it's sort of unmistakable and it can't really change. Mm. Does that sound really dark? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I would add that, you know, it's not just Facebook. I, I talk to plenty of people who say, well, I'm not on Facebook. And then my immediate next question is, well, are, are you on Instagram or are you on WhatsApp? because those are those are the same company it's it's led by the same people i mean misinformation is is growing on whatsapp and and nobody really knows what to do about it i 
you know, there are also countries all over the world where government institutions are issuing, you know, they're, they're, they're ruling largely through Facebook. You know, if you want to know what your local Department of Education is doing, you have to go to Facebook to find out. So Facebook's here. It's to stay. It's it's so intermeshed in, in really a really incredibly global way. I think the question is really just how can we how can we be more responsible um, in our usage of it? Yeah, I mean, the misinformation on WhatsApp thing is interesting, isn't it? Because it's it's private and it's encrypted. So you know who, who could re other, you know obviously facebook can see it theoretically but um it's a difficult one that so we have a question from karen wilson and goes back to this idea of you know hate and the proliferation of hate on facebook and she says you know is, is mark zuckerberg able if he wanted to tomorrow could he stop the proliferation of hate i mean i guess he couldn't stop everything but could can he turn this switch off or is it kind of almost beyond his control at this point frankenstein's monster and so what and so forth um there's no switch it's not ever that easy um could they do more yes there's always more they can do they're a trillion dollar company i think especially again i hate to go back to this but in the parts of the world where um facebook is still being used in massive numbers you know, if you if you if Facebook were to ever issue a per capita breakdown of how many moderators they had working on the you know in Portuguese, working in um, in Burmese, you know, working in all these other places, I'm sure that the number would be really frightening compared to what they have in terms of English language content mm -hmm. moderation. Um, so yes, there's always more that they can do, and and really there's um there's more governments can do as well in terms of helping Facebook figure out what 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 should be the role here. I mean, should governments have a role in saying to Facebook, right, we're drawing, our, our line is here. If you have speech on your platform that disenfranchises people from voting, that's, that, that's not, you know, that's not something we're going to allow. Um, you know, if you have content on your platform, which in the middle of a pandemic causes people to behave in a way that threatens public health, we're not going to allow that. Do governments start to play that role rather than waiting for Facebook to always be responsive? So one, one question I have is, is about, you know, you cover this in the book about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is obviously a big story in the UK as well. Um, how much of an inflection point was that? How big was that internally? How worried were Mark Zuckerberg and senior Facebook leaders about that scandal? Or was it just another PR issue for them? Yeah. It was a huge moment. It was a big turning point internally and also among the public. Mm. Um, this is, mind you, right after there were discoveries of foreign election interference on the, the platform. So there was already a, a suspicion around the company and also anger towards the company um, among users, lawmakers around the world. So Cambridge Analytica, what that did was it actually gave people a different view of Facebook and understanding how the machine works a little bit more, understanding how data was had been transferred for many, many years between the company and third parties, thousands of third parties. And it just, it was a wake up call for, for users in that they realized, wow, the amount of data I have is, uh, the, the amount of data that Facebook has on me is so vast and so broad. And not only that, but they've been giving it away to so many other third parties. They've been essentially polluting the internet with my own data. I have lost control. Mm -hmm. So it was another, it was almost just another way of looking at Facebook and understanding and educating people about how Facebook operates as a technology and as a business. It was a huge inflection point. The delete Facebook sort of movement on, on Twitter and other social media platforms sort of came from that. So, and internally, they were absolutely afraid of the fallout. And so we have a couple of questions that I will lump together, um, both anonymous. One, someone wants to know, what happened to F8, Fate? The Facebook dating oh. service, which someone seems oh. very disappointed oh. didn't take off. And the other is what happened to Libra and the, the plan to launch a Facebook oh. currency. And I guess I would, I would lump those together and say, are they still innovating at Facebook? You know, are they still coming up with new ways? You know, I, I remember, didn't they buy sort of Oculus Rift a while back? Uh, yeah. You know, um, and VR, you know, virtual reality and stuff. Are Facebook still, are, you know, how kind of, because, you know, a lot of what they seem to do is buy up competition and, you know, other people do the innovating and Facebook just buys it all, which is what they did with WhatsApp and Instagram. But are they still internally looking to sort of mold our future with things like Libra 
fates. Some of them will obviously be rubbish. Others might not. You know, what, what, what's that kind of forward thinking in that way? You know, um, Facebook would love to continue to buy the competition. I think many founders in Silicon Valley are no longer interested in selling to Facebook, mm. um, largely because of the experience of companies like Instagram and WhatsApp that were promised certain things by Mark Zuckerberg, including autonomy. And uh, the, the, you know, they were promised Facebook was going to maintain some of their values around privacy and security. And they didn't see those things happen. And now, you know, you speak to founders who say, well, I wouldn't sell to Facebook because I don't trust them to honor um, some of their agreements. But you know, now Facebook is much more in the business of really trying to copy um, or mimic popular platforms out there. We saw them recently announce um, a plan to get newsletters started on their platform. I think it was uh, a few months ago now that they launched Reels, which was meant to be sort of a competitor to TikTok. Neither one of those appears to be very successful. They're still innovating. They're still trying to get ahead of, of competition or, or imitate popular features of other of their competition. But I, I do think that, you know, at least look at TikTok right now. It's it's really um it's it's growth is immense. It's tremendous. It's really threatening to encroach on some of mm. Facebook's sort of core user base. Um, I think Mark Zuckerberg is very 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 worried that all of the public backlash against Facebook as a company and and this idea among young people that it's just not cool anymore to be on Facebook is is going to ultimately hurt them. So so we think TikTok is keeping Mark Zuckerberg up at night or, or perhaps intruding on his sort of yogic meditation or whatever. Anything hot, anything that's hot keeps him up at night. Yes. Right. Well, because he was once he was once the eight kid. He was once the hot, you know, you know, the hot product on the market was was his. And I, I'm sure that's um that's difficult if that's no longer the case. Yeah. So we have a question. Um, you know, is it true that Kamala Harris, the vice president, is soft on big tech because the tech giants are based in her state? I would extend that and say there have been accusations, particularly from the left in America and, and the right, actually that the Biden administration is staffed with lots of Silicon Valley types, that they are, you know, in the same way that the Obama administration was very close uh -huh. to Silicon Valley, that that, that that has been echoed in the Biden administration. Uh, are, they, are they somewhat compromised? You know, for all that they, you know, Cecilia point out, they appointed people like Tim Wu. Right, right. Pro-regulation, but actually we also see a hell of a lot of alumnus uh, staffing across Washington. This is obviously your bread and butter. So, yeah. so, so what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the Obama administration, the revolving door during the Obama administration was much, much bigger and much, much more active. But you're absolutely right, Josh. There are a lot of people who have come from tech who are in the administration. That, um, it's very interesting that people who have been names floated for very important roles um, in antitrust, for example, um, at the Department of Justice, who have backgrounds working for tech or their firms even working for tech, their law firms working for techs, their, their nominations have been slowed down. They have not been named because so many public interest groups, so much, so much of the public is so upset with the idea that tech is influencing from within, trying to go into the administration and influence from within. So I think that what's changed is accountability about that. People just don't think that that's okay. It's just such a such a common practice in Washington, and I think folks in Washington are a little bit jaded about the revolving door. I think outside of Washington. Most people I speak to are sort of astonished to hear that people recycle in and out of government in the private sector. And I think at, in this instance, there's just a, a, a new stance. A lot of people are saying, no, that's not okay. And so that's holding up actually nominees. Mm. Well, that is probably quite encouraging in a way because you know it used to be Goldman Sachs and, 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 yeah. and the big banks. So then there's obviously still some of that too, but it, it is Silicon Valley is the kind of new, the new hotness, so to speak. But there's a question from, Alex B, uh, who says, what role is Sheryl Sandberg playing now if she's been diminished? And I, I would add to that, could you see Sheryl Sandberg leaving Facebook, given the kind of status quo that you described, that she's, she's no longer the sort of very prominent established number two to Zuckerberg's number one? So, so what, what is she doing and could, and could she end up uh, finding something else to do? Yes, I mean, over the years, there's been a lot of chatter about Sheryl Sandberg leaving Facebook, as we write at one point in our book. She was looking at a job in the Clinton administration. Had Hillary Clinton won, we would have likely seen her in the Treasury Department. Um, you know, I think Sheryl Sandberg isn't tied to Facebook the way that Mark Zuckerberg is. She has had a persona and a career outside of it with her book, Lean In and Option B. And I imagine that she wants something else because at Facebook, she'll always be a number two um, position. 
but you know we also know that she's someone that that isn't going to leave on a low note she wants to kind of you know recap some of her reputation she wants to to you know to not be blamed for all the failings and faults of facebook and so i'm not sure i think it's a it's a question of um when she leaves and not if she leaves mm. um and in terms of what she's doing now you know she's taken on this interesting portfolio of doing um sort of outreach to small businesses um we've seen her really promoting this idea that facebook is going to be doing more with small businesses it uh especially during the pandemic that was something that she she talked about a lot it was very interesting to me though to notice that while she was doing this you know she was in a sense, left out of the bigger discussions about the pandemic, you had Mark Zuckerberg being the one to appear in and in, in, in interview um, Dr. Fauci. You had Mark Zuckerberg being the one to talk to the head of, you know, various kind of World Health Organizations and play that much more, you know, high profile and diplomatic role. So just a couple more things then. We've got, why does Facebook get so much backlash for outrage, but Twitter and YouTube don't? I mean, obviously they do sometimes, yeah. but do you think yeah. Facebook gets un an un disproportionate amount of backlash? I say fair on YouTube, and I'll come back to that. Um, I would remind folks on Twitter that Twitter is actually much smaller than Facebook, much, much smaller, though it does amplify messages in a way that's so powerful, especially the former president, President Trump. And that information gets hops onto other platforms and makes it into the mainstream. mainstream. Um, look, Twitter is um, has been more proactive when it comes to political figures and they've been willing to experiment as well and they're very transparent on how they are coming up with a speech policy they also say very just just very openly like look we're trying to figure it out please academics come in we want to share all of our data with you and what we know come in and help us academics the public etc so twitter has definitely not made all the right decisions it's made tons of mistakes in the long run but they've been willing to be a little bit more um um, aggressive. So I think that in that way, there's a lot of anger towards Twitter, but people can see that they're trying to, to, to change things. YouTube is a really fascinating case study. It has kind of been a sleeper. People do not pay attention to how, how YouTube is such an important source of information and misinformation. Mm -hmm. And Shira has reported on this quite a bit. There is just so much dangerous information that gets caught, that gets um, sort of passed along and passed along and not, and also through the recommendation recommendation engines, just keep being amplified. I think YouTube has taken some efforts, especially on the recommendation engine to try to suppress some of that and slow down some of that. But it, I, I, we actually kind of laugh within the tech team at the New York Times that we don't laugh, but we, we always do kind of scratch our heads. Like, it's so interesting that people don't focus so, as much on YouTube. Mm. We're very interested in focusing on YouTube. That I should yes. say that. Um, uh, uh, as a reporter who covers misinformation, I'm always kicking myself for not doing more YouTube stories that they are more difficult to do because YouTube is constantly removing videos and then not explaining why or making it impossible to even find out when they've removed the video or, or why. Um, but I absolutely think that's going to be something a lot more reporters start to look at and, and try to sort of unlock is this idea of, of how misinformation and how hateful speech is being spread on YouTube. So we have our last question and it's a, we're going to do it as an exit question, yes or no, from both of you. Do you think Mark Zuckerberg will ever be satisfied with the amount of power he has? Mm. Oh, I'm going to cop out and say, <laughs> I'm going to cop out and say, um, I don't know. It depends on how much power he gets. <laughs> Fair enough. How much you You know, I've, uh, it's an expression. Um, I first heard it in Arabic. I don't know where it originated, but it, it goes to the book, you know, those in power begets a thirst for more power. It's probably the best translation. Mm. Um, I've certainly seen it in, in powerful people that I've encountered in my life that once they have some power, they tend to have a thirst for much more. Mm. Um, so I imagine if Mark follows that pattern, he will continue to want to be increasingly powerful. I don't know where you go from here in terms yeah. of power. Um, but I, I, I imagine much like Bill Gates when he left Microsoft, you know, he became the head of the, um, sorry, he became the head of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I can see Mark doing something like that and becoming powerful in a different way. Brilliant. Well, uh, that just about ties it up. I just want to remind everyone you can buy a discounted copy of Shira and Cecilia's excellent book. And it is excellent. I say that I have, I have actually read it cover to cover at this point. Um, an Ugly Truth, Inside Facebook's Battle for Domination. 
Um, so yeah, you have the link for that. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Cecilia and Shira for lovely answers. Uh, very insightful and entertaining, which is you know, the combination we want. So great to do, great to see you both. And uh, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for your questions.